Welcome back to another GCN Tech Clinic where I answer the questions you've been submitting using the hashtag AskGCNTech. So let's dive straight in to our first question. First question is from Toon Van Bruggen who says, Hi guys, in big races, you always see the riders throw away their water bottles at the start of a climb to try to save weight and go faster. But how much difference would it make if you rode up a climb with no water bottles in comparison to two full water bottles? Well, I can actually tell you the difference it'll make because I've done some calculations online using some climbing time estimation calculators. And I can tell you that for a pro level or world tour rider who is racing up Alpe d'Huez, so a famous climb that's 14 kilometers long, if they were riding at about 400 watts and they were to save one kilogram of weight, so that's taking off two full water bottles, 500 grams each, they would in fact cycle about 25 seconds faster, which is a huge difference for just taking some weight off of your bike. So that's the reason why you see them trying to get rid of any unnecessary weight. There you go. Next question is from John Jerez Lopez in Gasio. I'm not sure I've said that right, so sorry about that. Says, okay, let's try to end this. Bike engineers, hear me out. So he's talking about bottom bracket lubrication. Why don't we just put an oil reservoir in the bottom bracket like we have in vehicles to enjoy smooth rolling of bearings in the bottom bracket and then we can just change out the oil every two to three thousand kilometers and then he asked for your thoughts um i don't think that would work at all so the the issue i see with this is a car uses a sump to contain all of that oil but that doesn't lubricate the engine the engine is lubricated because the oil pump takes that oil drives it all the way around the engine and to the key locations at high pressure. Whereas to have an oil pump, a sump, and a system to lubricate the bottom bracket in a bike, there's absolutely no way that's possible. So I just don't think it's a realistic outcome. And there's absolutely no way any manufacturer is gonna be able to incorporate that that's light, works, and is reliable. So I think the best option to do is to stick to the system that we have and use the best grease suitable for how long you want your bottom bracket to last in between service intervals. So our next question is from that Uncle Jet says, hey guys, my carbon frame has developed a line slash crack on the down tube. Is there any way to differentiate between paint cracks or cracks in the actual carbon frame? Well, that is a bit of a tricky one. Um, and some of the easiest ways to try to test a carbon frame is simply by finding that slightly damaged area and you can just press it with your fingers and you'll be able to feel if the frame has got a bit more give in that area to some of the other areas that shouldn't be damaged. You can then also tap where the damaged area of paint is and you can often hear whether there's a slightly different or dull sounding noise compared to some of the other areas of the frame. So you've got an audi audible way of checking that. But the only surefire way to check that your frame is safe and secure to be ridden is to have it x-rayed by a specialist carbon frame repair, such as the carbon frame repair shop that we visited a few months ago. And they can give you a certain answer to make sure you've got a bike that's safe to be ridden on and give you complete peace of mind. So there you go. Next question in is from David Langley who says, Hi, I've had problems with my saddle tipping back mid-ride. Usually when I hit a bump, the seat post is carbon. I've correctly talked it up before I go out. Should I be using carbon grip paste or just over-talking it? Just help with a little emoji. Um, yes, do use carbon grip paste. It's always a good idea to use that, even if you haven't got a problem with components moving or slipping, it's just good practice to do that. So apply some carbon grip paste. In terms of over torquing the saddle clamps, I definitely would not do that. Um, stick to the specified torque settings of all of the components on your bike. But something that which did spring to mind is to make sure that your torque wrench is accurately calibrated. I mean, a difference of one newton meter or so isn't gonna make the difference, but you could have a torque wrench that is say, a couple of newton meters out and then you might not be getting the full torque setting that you need on that component and as such it could move and failing that my third suggestion avoid riding over bumps when you're sat in the saddle <laughs> then you won't have that problem whatsoever but yeah definitely don't over tighten the bolts next question in is from what a username the van with no name interesting it seems to me that q factor also applies to handlebars and stems and they've kindly let us know that they think cockpits are only found in aircrafts. Super narrow bars are a joke. Aerodynamics of a road bike are quite negligible. 
And then they're saying when you're stood up pulling on the bars for leverage, power seems to be a missed point. Works as an axis, almost like gy almost like a gyroscopic action. Guys, not very happy about narrow handlebars, but is a question that's worth answering. So yep, stability and control of your bike are affected by the width of your handlebars, as is the leverage when you're out the saddle, sprinting or climbing, for example. And yes, a wider handlebar does offer greater stability than a narrower one. But in terms of aerodynamic drag, it puts your body position in a less optimal position to make you slower in terms of your aerodynamic resistance going through the wind. So it's all about finding the right balance between a wide handlebar and a narrow handlebar. So what suits your requirements best and what is the most important for you? So if your goal is to ride as fast as possible and be as aerodynamic as possible, then yeah, you do need to have a narrow handlebar at the sacrifice of a little bit of that stability, control and leverage from the wide bar. But if stability and control is your most important thing, then sure, go for the wide handlebar. It'll feel a bit better when you're out climbing up the side, out the saddle and stuff like that. So just pick out what's most important to you and then choose your bike components accordingly. Next question in is from Gavin Dewal. It says, hi, Alex and Ollie, brackets or Manon. Always good to remember everybody. I was watching Formula One the other day and saw that there was a different slick and wet tires um, so how much difference they make in the rain, especially when cornering. Question is, why don't pros use specific wet tires? Then they suggest they could have a bike set up with just the wet tires and make a quick bike swap mid-race if they know it's going to be wet. Surely a wider tire would help as well with grooves. Um, I get exactly where you're coming from here, but the principles of tire grip in the wet are completely different on a Formula One car or any car, to be honest, and a bike. So the reason you have a tread pattern in the tire is to dissipate water. And that's very crucial on a wide tire, such as a Formula One tire, like this wide, car tires this wide. Because they've got that wider surface area, if they don't have any grooves to disperse the water, they run the risk of aquaplaning over the top and then losing all grip and control. But that isn't a problem on a bike tire because it has such a narrow footprint. So you can think of your road tire contacting the road, the contact patch is a similar sort of size to your thumb. And there's absolutely no way you can run the risk of that tire aquaplaning over the water. Um, and it's a fairly proven fact that the main component of a tire which dictates the grip is the pressure it's run at and the compound of the rubber. So uh, yeah, I don't think we're gonna see special bike tires with grooves on them just for the wet. Next question is from Abdullah Fiaz. Says, I'm getting a new road bike next month. Good on you. And I've got £100 to spend on accessories for it. Please tell me what to do. I'm kind of lost. So a new bike, £100, I would get a few key components. I'd get one or two bottle cages and some bottles. I'd get a saddle bag, uh, two inner tubes, a pump and a multi-tool. I think you might be pushing it slightly to get all of that for under £100. But if you shop around, get some good deals and choose wisely in the products, I think you might just about come in under your budget of £100. And they're probably the best starting points to go. You've got water, so you can go out for a longer ride, and some spares, should you be unfortunate enough to have any problems, and that'll get you home safe and sound. So on to our final question for this week's GCN Tech Clinic. And it would appear to be a slightly, hopefully, tongue-in-cheek question. It's from Eric H, who says, Question one, on my Garmin, if I only need 15% of battery charge on a ride, but I have it charged to 100%, will the extra 85% of battery weigh me down? No, it won't. And question two, if I spit during my ride, will I lose weight and save some grams? What on earth? Um, I'm not sure I even really need to warrant answering that question, but some very kind person called Steve B has replied in the comments to him and says yes to both of those and also suggested <laughs> <laughs> they also suggested that you should breathe out at the beginning of your ride and not breathe back in again until the end because of that extra air in your lungs will weigh you down and slow you down across your ride. Make of that what you will. What a way to end the GCN Tech Link. I hope you enjoyed it. If I haven't got to your question, sorry about that. And please keep submitting it in the comment section down below using the hashtag AskGCNTech. Well, and I'll see you next week. Bye.